Oh my god, hey! Welcome back to my theatre-themed YouTube channel. My name is Mickey Joe, and I am obsessed with all things theatre. I am a professional theatre critic and a content creator based here in the UK, and I am so excited that finally I got to go and see A Strange Loop. Here it is. Voila, look at this massive program. It's the same size as my actual face. I got to go and see A Strange Loop at the Barbican Theatre. This is the London transfer of the Broadway musical, the Tony Award winning Pulitzer Prize winning Broadway musical written by Michael R. Jackson. If you've been following my videos for a while, you may remember back in lockdown when this show won the Pulitzer Prize having not yet made it to Broadway, I was like, what is this? Why have I not heard of this show? And I did a full reaction video to the cast recording where it blew my entire mind and I was so taken aback by it and surprised by it and deeply, deeply fascinated beyond anything else. Then they announced they were going to Broadway. I so wanted to go and see the show, but sadly my first ever trip to New York earlier this year came after the production closed at the Lyceum Theatre on Broadway back in January. However, the show has now arrived in London and I am so excited to tell you all about it. Did it live up to my expectations? What on earth is it about? And who do I think should definitely go and see it? All of that to come in today's review video. Now, if you enjoy this one, make sure to subscribe to my theatre-themed YouTube channel. Not only will there be many more reviews coming soon, but there will be news videos, there will be features, there will be interviews, and lots more stage of content for you to enjoy. If you want to see some of those videos before everyone else and gain access to some exclusive content, hit the link in the description and you can sign up to become one of my channel members. Now, let's talk about a strange loop at the Barbican Centre in London, but first, enjoy this sneak peek of the show's opening night curtain call. <laughs> So A Strange Loop, entirely from the mind of the brilliant rising star musical theatre writer Michael R. Jackson, is about a character named Usher, who is also working as an Usher on a Broadway show. And he is writing a musical about a young gay black writer, writing a musical about a young gay black writer, writing a musical about a young gay black writer, much of which is all drawing on Michael R. Jackson's own lived experience. In fact, there's a fun footnote here because Michael R. Jackson is obviously named Michael Jackson, and is not necessarily the most well-known person to have that name, so has named his character in his musical Usher, also sharing a name with a music superstar, as well as reducing him to his job role in the way that he is often seen by people. This is just the beginning of the way in which the show talks about identity. So on stage, we have the character of Usher and six other black performers who are playing his thoughts, and they take on various roles. They take on his inner self-loathing, they take on his sexual desire, they take on sexual partners throughout the show, they take on the roles of his family members, they play his parents in phone conversations, they play doctors and agents and patrons at the Broadway theatre where he works. And through this sort of loose narrative structure, we see different vignettes from his life, through which he is trying to derive a meaning and a focus and a narrative for the musical that he is writing. But these complex and difficult themes which are important to him sort of swirl around him, this ongoing tension that he experiences with his parents who are very religious, who uh, do not endorse his homosexuality, the way in which he is sidelined as a plus-sized black gay man within the gay community, as well as his own complicated relationship to his culture and to his sexuality and to his race and to his religion. This show talks profoundly about identity at a very specific intersection. It describes itself as a big black and queer ass American Broadway show that also talks about colorism, that also talks, like I said, about religion, about body image. And yet at that intersection of all of these different things, it transcends that specificity with this message that just speaks to the concept of being 
othered, the concept of feeling isolated and struggling to sort of furnish your own identity in the wake of a lot of outside oppressive factors, whether that's society or your own upbringing or the gay community or capitalism, various other things. I'm aware I'm making this sound very abstract and very artsy. It's also funny, it's down to earth, it has moments where it's very structurally profound and poetic and psychological, but for the most part it's just deeply relatable. We see Usher navigating situations in his life that become increasingly theatricalized, and a lot of the earlier moments of the show are played for broad comedic laughs, and they are staged quite simply. You have uh, some great scenes where you're seeing interactions between Usher's other family members, talking about some family drama that's going on, and they're all named after different characters from The Lion King. Maybe the caricatures broaden just a little bit. You have some very provocative songs about the gay community and about cruising and about gay dating apps. And what happens over the course of the show is this tone just starts to slide and just starts to modulate a little bit. And as we go deeper and deeper and deeper into this narrative loop, it starts to get more existential, but also more tense. There's this creeping sense of unease and the emotional confrontations that Usher experiences and that we see playing out on stage become increasingly visceral and increasingly challenging. In many ways, I would say this show sort of shifts from an invitation to a provocation. But to tell you more about all of that, I need to tell you what I thought of this show and the people who worked on it. So I had the greatest expectations for this piece. Maybe my expectations were a little bit too high, dangerously high, but this was just utterly sensational. It's incredible. And I was looking at it with this critical mindset and trying to really just appraise the whole thing. And it's messy and it's raw. And there are things you could look at structurally towards the second half of the one act, 100 minute show that this is. And you could think that could be tailored, that could be cleaned, that could be amended. The ending of the show could find sort of a slightly greater meaning. There are moments where it could be a little bit more focused, a little bit more honed. And yet, I don't think it should do any of that. Because what you come to recognize this show as, as an audience member, is the beating heart of its creator and composer that has just been ripped out of his chest and still beats on that stage and bleeds. It's raw, it's edgy, it's provocative, it is rough around the edges in places. But the emotional impact that that carries with it is so pure and so unfiltered, and it is just hugely affecting. It's incredibly powerful. It's moving, it's uplifting, it's devastating. And the way it transposes itself from this sassy, irreverent comedy that we have in the first few scenes to this exposure of a soul that it becomes by the end is just masterfully done. We have this very wide but very short set with six different illuminated doorways through which the six thoughts emerge and talk to Usher who is standing on stage and the way that this is staged, the way that this is choreographed and the way that this set works in the early portions of the show, very traditional. And what happens is the idea of what this show is and its scope just expands. It does that both figuratively and literally. And so the staging accompanies this idea where the show delves deeper and deeper and deeper into Usher's psyche and psychology and soul. And the stage does the same thing. It lifts up, it expands, things move back. We get this increasing sense of scale. Everything becomes heightened, more theatricalized. We get this tonal shift where we go to these much darker places. And the tone of different scenes becomes wildly disparate. And the storytelling means change completely as well. We have these like sort of dream sequence musical numbers juxtaposing a very sinister romantic encounter that is just staged in a much more literal and necessarily visceral way. One has huge set pieces and fantasy lighting, the other is dark and brooding and genuinely intimidating. So the creatives whose work I've been talking about there, Stephen Brackett, the director, Arnolfo Maldonado, who did the set design, Jen Schriever, who did the lighting design. I also want to mention Montana Levi Blanco, who did the costume design. I really enjoy the costumes in this show. Again, they begin subtler, even when you have the thoughts depicting Usher's parents, the way that they are costumed in order to do that becomes increasingly elaborate and everything you're seeing on stage, you are seeing through Usher's eyes, you're seeing through this lens, and the design accompanies that and does so very cleverly. Before I move on and talk to you about the material, I want to mention Raja Feather Kelly, who did the choreography, and moments of it are beautiful and sort of contemporary, and then you have other parts that are whimsical and charming and tongue-in-cheek and play on pop culture references. 
again, it's accompanying the tonal shift within the show. We have these earlier lighthearted moments where the choreography does similarly. There's one amazing part where one of the thoughts played by Charlene Hector, Thought One actually, announces to Usher as the thought responsible for his sexual ambivalence, um, that they're going to make sure that that is prioritized and then goes into this skippy little pony dance step. It's hysterical stuff. But then very quickly afterwards, we have songs like In a White Girl, where Usher is on stage spotlit and you have the thoughts swarming around him doing these beautiful contemporary movements and then parts at the end of the show with the song Memory Song with this just very simple bit of choreography that is so striking and so meaningful and absolutely has the potential to make you cry. It conceptualizes something very emotional and very sad and very meaningful in a profoundly beautiful way. But what I really want to talk to you about here is the material, because this show I think is utterly groundbreaking. And he's pulled on influences from different things for sure, but what Michael R. Jackson has created here has such a specific and unique and new voice in musical theatre. And it's an urgent voice, it's a powerful voice, it's a vulnerable voice. The vulnerability that is exposed in this piece is peerless, I think. It's honest, it's vital, it's incredibly brave, and it's unafraid to challenge, to challenge a predominantly white audience, to challenge the New York critical culture, to challenge various things throughout the show. The score generally has three moods. We have these sweeping internal monologue songs that are beautiful. We have these peppy songs sung between Usher and his thoughts that begin as deliberately peppy and comically peppy. And then we have this sort of ironic pep. And to use professional critical terminology, they are absolute bops. But we get to a point later in the show where they become uncomfortably peppy because it doesn't resonate with what we're seeing play out on stage, which is something that we experience from the thoughts in this show a lot. They are supportive, but then also pseudo-supportive and occasionally just openly malevolent. I also like how the material has been assigned to different thoughts to sort of characterize them. The one that represents sort of these maternal ideas, the one that represents a lot of the emotions that are specifically connected to Usher's father, so that thought will play Usher's father very often. Everything has been placed with a tremendous amount of care and precision and cleverness and attention to detail. Nothing in this show is happening accidentally. And the lyrics reflect that attention to detail as well. I have only listened to the off-Broadway cast recording for this show. I hadn't listened to the Broadway one, but the slight lyric changes that have happened in various different songs show such a little attention to detail. Like I said, it just fine tunes a lyric and an idea to just reposition it slightly and to just shift Usher's mindset in that moment. And the changing of a no to a yes, the changing of a line so that it scans a little bit differently. Some really clever ideas that show a tremendous amount of care has been taken on these lyrics. I don't know if you get that in every new musical. In fact, I've listened to enough of them and I know you don't. I told you there was a third mood within this score and it's these kind of expansive dramatic monologues put to music. They're not necessarily a rigid song structure. It reminds me more of what Janine Tesori has done in shows like Kimberly Akimbo and Caroline on Change, where it's a dramatic monologue that is just theatricalized and musicalized, and it's sort of, it flows and it changes and it shifts, and you get these long songs where it isn't so much a standalone ditty as this theatrical explosion. And this is showing, again, this is a writer who really knows how to use musical theater as an art form and use it creatively and powerfully. So having understudied the role on Broadway, Kyle Ramar Freeman is playing the role of Usher in the West End with such authority and such purpose that it banishes that concept of understudying the role far from anyone's minds. He owns it with such certainty that there are people in this audience who think that he might also be the writer. He does it with such unparalleled conviction. And there are so many triumphs within his performance. The vulnerability, the boldness, the delicacy, the reaction in his facial expressions, the heart and the tenderness that he exudes on stage connects us immediately to him as an audience. And we are tethered to him emotionally for the entirety of the show because we are in his mind and in his soul for the duration of the thing. And he invites us in with such warmth and such openness and again, just an honesty. Everything good that I've said about this show, I can say the same thing about Kyle's performance in it. Vocally, he's just astonishing. There are some soaring high tenor moments in this score and he performs them with such a strength that simultaneously has a fragility 
And given how much emotional turmoil and trauma that he endures and he remembers and he sort of inflicts on himself in many ways throughout this show and this constructed narrative, what really surprised me is the charm and the levity and the lightheartedness with which he begins the thing. Even a few scenes into the show, amidst rejection from the gay community and this sort of very aggressive medical advice, he's capable of being silly and playful alongside these moments of tremendous angst. And I think that comes from his brilliant understanding of this material because Michael R. Jackson does that as well. This show does not take itself wholly seriously in every single moment. It has moments of, of silliness and playfulness, just like he does. Kyle is joined on stage by a wonderful supporting cast playing his thoughts, who I want to tell you about briefly now. So Charlene Hector plays Thought One. She has some brilliant standout comedy moments in the show. She has a beautiful song that she sings called A Sympathetic Ear. She gets to play Whitney Houston for a hot second. She's very sweet. She sings beautifully. She exudes this maternal warmth, but she is also hysterically funny and does so with just a couple of line readings and a couple of bits of choreography. She's just hilarious. Thought Two is played by Nathan Amarque Laria. He is a fascinating performer. I love the acting choices that he makes. And the most interesting to me are when he is playing Usher's self-confessed self-loathing and the sort of back and forth that the two of them have. And he is assertive and cruel and cold. He also plays Usher's mother for a bit. Yukai Usher is thought three, my favorite to watch in the song Exile in Gayville, because the way that he is parodying this sort of Jim Bunny gay stereotype hilariously funny and he's doing so so tongue-in-cheekly and then a completely different but equally comic characterization of Usher's brother who doesn't want to support the mother of his child later in the show it's very funny and like I said broad caricatures but hilariously done. Thought four, Tendai Humphrey Sitama. Now he plays Usher's mother at a pivotal moment in the show when they have this very difficult exchange uh, when Usher tries to impart a lot of truth to his parents and tries to convey some sense of understanding and search for humanity within them. And this scene just turns and shifts in so many different ways where there are revelations you think are going to come and then some slightly unexpected things come forth as well. And Tendai conjures this sorrow tinged with a huge amount of selfishness remarkably. Thought five is Danny Bailey. He was the one I told you about before who plays Usher's father for much of the show and a lot of the ideas connected to Usher's father. Now I give a lot of praise in these videos to people who have tremendous vocal prowess and strength at moments of great height throughout the score, but the way he utilizes bass vocals, stirring, atmospheric, and bold. In a handful of his portrayals throughout the show, just watching his facial expressions and just listening to his line readings, fantastic. He absolutely gets this material. All of them do. I mean, it's brilliant to see this cast of British actors joining an American creative team and an American lead actor, and so understanding the tone and the humour of what it is that they're doing. Finally, Thought Six is played by Eddie Elliott, hugely committed as a performer. The energy that he is bringing on stage. He plays a very difficult scene with a romantic encounter that I told you about earlier in this video uh, towards the end of the show. It's so biting and contemptuous, and the ferocity with which he delivers some very difficult lines of dialogue are a huge part in why it's such an affecting scene to watch. In terms of stand-up moments from the show, I told you about the three different styles generally that are present in the score, and I think I have one great moment to indicate each. So of the fun and light-hearted peppy songs that sort of poke at cultural conventions, Exile in Gayville is a lot of fun. Some very provocative lyrics, but it takes aim squarely at gay dating apps and at gay culture and at racism and colorism and a host of other issues within the gay community, but the way it creates these other characters, the way it's staged, it's fun and it's entertaining while also being very important. I spoke about longer musicalized monologues and there's this whole section called AIDS is God's Punishment and this is at the height of theatricality and this massive set piece emerging from behind the facade of what we thought this show was going to be. And that's exactly what it's doing tonally as well, because everything we've become comfortable with in this storytelling is stripped away and we get this completely different idea. And it probably endures as the most memorable part of the show. It feels emotionally very raw, very challenging to consume, which I think is also part of what this show is. There's a truth and an 
honesty to this show that ought not to be easy to consume, honestly, because reality isn't. Reality isn't always palatable and comfortable. Finally, Memory Song is just so affecting to me, and this is Usher singing about his experiences with religion as he was coming to terms with his identity as a young boy and sort of his peers within the black community who struggled with that idea and reacted differently to how he did. The simplicity of the staging and the musical repetitiveness where he is just singing this sort of repetitive refrain but the lyrics are just getting a little bit more emotionally incisive and then there's a moment where the lighting builds, we have this piece of choreography that I told you about before that's very simple but very powerful, very evocative. And at the height of this song's emotional power you have these black men on stage, they suddenly come in singing an ensemble harmony line that echoes what Usher has been singing. Usher then jumps an octave above. It's this emotional outpouring. It sounds thrilling and it just hits you squarely in the heart. If you find yourself anywhere within this Venn diagram of identity, if you are a black person, if you are a member of the LGBT plus community, if you are someone who's plus sized and doesn't feel represented for that reason or for any of those reasons, then this show is going to speak to you profoundly and personally. But like I said before, it transcends the specificity of those identities and it just talks about humanity. I resonate with part of those ideas, but I'm also a white person. This show was not conceived with me in mind, but it remains just so impactful to me and I think it's important as one of the people that it challenges in the show that I go and see this show. I think people need to go and be receptive to art that is beyond their lived experience but you will be surprised and maybe even taken aback by how personally this might affect you. I got to speak with the cast and creatives and the writer Michael R. Jackson uh, earlier in the week before I got to see the show and he very succinctly described it. He said for some people a strange loop is a mirror and for other people it's a window and I think it's important that both of those groups of people go and see this show. The people who need this and who deserve this show and will benefit from it and will get this catharsis from it. And the people who will learn and be challenged and be provoked maybe, but will see things that it's important for them to see. If you hadn't already gathered, this is not a show that is suitable for young children. I would check on the show's website to find the actual age guidance, um, but I dare say it's like teenager plus off the top of my head because it is very provocative. There are things depicted on stage that sort of, um, things are implied that are quite graphic. And there's language and there's a bit of sexuality, but more so than anything else, it's just emotionally challenging and hard hitting. But those have been my thoughts on a strange loop at the Barbican. I hope that you have enjoyed this review. I hope if you knew nothing about this show that it's maybe convinced you that this is something you might want to buy tickets for. Honestly, it's going to run at the Barbican Theatre and I implore you to go and see it while it's there. It's an incredible, beautiful piece of musical theatre that I cannot recommend enough. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you've enjoyed. If you did, make sure to subscribe to my theatre-themed YouTube channel for more reviews, news, features, and everything else that I put on here. I hope that everyone is staying safe and that you have a stagey day. For ten more seconds, I'm Mickey Joe Theatre. Oh my god, hey. Thanks for watching. Have a stagey day. Subscribe! <laughs>